So we'll talk about the user datagram uh, program UDP. Um, so we'll, we'll show you the relationship with other protocols in the TCP IP. Then we'll explain the format of UDP packet. Remember that we were talking a lot about the formats of this class. All right, because UDP by it, by the end, it's like a packet which has a header. Mostly we're going to take a look at the header. And then we'll discuss the services provided by the UDP, um, you can, such as process-to-process -process delivery, multiplexing, demultiplexing, and queuing. These are basically the three that are provided. And then we'll show you how to calculate the optional checksum. Okay, the checksum to check for the errors. All right and the sender um, that needs to add um, uh, um, pseudo holder to, uh, f to the packet when calculating the check sum and we'll discuss how some application programs can benefit from uh, simplicity of UDP remember UDP is a connection list so it's not reliable protocol that means there is no flow control and there is no error uh, control so why we use it okay all right so um, as you see in here this is the uh, position of UDP uh, in the TCP um, so in the bottom two layers you have the physical and you have the data link layer so this will have the underlying LAN and WAN technologies then you'll have the network layer, and we already went over IP, we covered ARP, we covered ICMP, we did not cover IGMP, which is like a routing protocol, but we covered RIP, if you remember the RIP as an example for routing a protocol. When you go to transport layer, okay, there's three protocols running usually. Either UDP, which is a connectionless protocol, and then the TCP, which is mostly used, is a connection-oriented protocol. Then the stream transport protocol, this is for media. And it's, it's also a connection-oriented protocol. When you go to the upper layer, the fifth layer, there are so many, maybe tens or hundreds of protocols. Okay, many of you have used FTP, file transfer protocol. FTP, by the way, FTP, it used TCP it's um, uh, um, um, connection oriented protocol there is something called trivial FTP trivial file transfer protocol the trivial file transfer protocol it uses the UDP all right then you have the DNS which uses the UDP uh, simple network management protocol DHCP dynamic host allocation uh, simple mail transport protocol, simple network management protocol, and many, many other, other, um, other application layer protocols. Some of them will use UDP or TCP or SCTP. All right. So it's a clear to to understand what where where are these protocols located in the map. So the UDP packets okay the UDP packets called datagrams okay data grams and have a fixed size header of eight bytes all right eight bytes what is the size of the TCP header 20 bytes so what we notice in here the UDP header is smaller than the TCP that ma makes it faster faster because you have to transmit much less data every time if we need to take a look at the header here is the format of the header so you have the header which is 8 bytes as we say in here uh, 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 8 bytes and then the rest of the data in here all right which is um, uh, if you have zero data the header will be 8 bytes but usually 8 to 65 535 bytes or in symbol it will be like 2 to the power how much 64 right right yeah 
All right, so uh, the header format, so this is the box, the orange box or the pink box in here. Let's take a look at it in here. That's the header format. It has how many? It's eight. It has eight bytes. So in here, two bytes, two bytes. So source port number, which is 16 bit, and the destination port number, which is another uh, 16 bit, right? Then total length, and then the checksum. What is the function of the checksum? Is to check if there's an error in the header on the packet. Right? You agree? All right. So that is the format. So we have the source again. Let's take a look in here. We have the source uh, port number, um, and this port number is uh, usually 16. I mean, port number is always 16 uh, bits. IP version 4 is 32 bits. IP version 6 is 32 bits. MAC address is 48 bits. So this is like common knowledge that you have to use. All right. And this could be from the ephemeral port numbers, or it could be with known port numbers, which we covered last time. Then we have the destination port number. Um, again, this could be the with known port number, or it could be from the ephemeral port number. And then we have the length in here, the total, the total length, which is another 16-bit field. All right, and um, and the length, uh, the length. It will be uh, uh, it will be from z zero to sixty four. I'm sorry, this is sixteen, not sixty four. Sixteen. Okay, two to the power sixteen will give you this number, right? All right. So um, so that's the total number, um, uh, the number of ports that you uh, could have. All right. So now, how could we know the UDP length, the UDP packet length, the length in here, how we could know it? In the IP packet, if you remember, there was IP length, right? The IP length. And in here, it has the IP header length, the IP header length. So so we always could subtract the IP length. So if you, the UDP length, if you need to know the UDP length, it will equal to the IP length minus the IP, the IP header length sorry for the typing I mean, I'm writing with the mouse all right all right so take a look at here at this in here this is the following is a dump of the UDP header that's a UDP header that's the header eight bytes right so each two will give you one byte. So, all right, one byte, one byte, one byte, one byte, one byte. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, eight bytes. That's the header. Eight bytes, right? All right. So now it tells you what is the source port number. So when you take, so the first four bytes, the uh, first two bytes will give you the source port number. So what is the port number from here? CB, CB84, yeah. right? That's a port number. This is in hexadecimal. So you could convert it to what? To decimal to know the port number. What is the destination port number? So the destination port number are the next two bytes. So that means it's 0, 0, 0, D. That's the destination number. What is the total length? What is the total length? Okay. 
what is the total length of the user datagram? Where is the total length? Zero to C. Zero to C, yep. And here. So that's the total length, zero to C, right? Defi because this defines the length of the U2B packet. Okay. All right. So it's it's zero to C. So so zero to C how much is? How much is that? So C is how much? C twelve. C is a twelve, right? Yeah. And sixteen how much? So one is sixteen, right? Yeah. Sixteen plus twelve how much? Sixteen uh twenty twenty-eight. Twenty-eight. Okay, so so what is the length of the the data what is the length of the user datagram? Twenty-eight, 28. bytes, right? Twenty-eight yeah. bytes. All right. What is the length of the data? Okay, what is the length of the data? We already wrote the formula in here. The length of the data is the IP length. Okay, the IP length minus the IP header length, okay, so the length of the data is the length of the whole packet minus the length of the header. So what is the length of the whole packet in here? 20. 28. 28. And what's the, what's the length of the header? 20. 8. The header 8. 8. Yeah, okay, okay. The, the result is 20, sorry. So it's a 28 minus 8, eight 20. equals 20. All right simple then question e is the packet directed from a client to server or vice versa so how would they know that i have first to figure out what is the source port number so cb84 if you convert it to binary it will be 52 100 then when you say 0, 0, 0, d what is this port 14 uh, 13 actually 13 okay 13 okay so now this is clear so okay what we call the 13 world known port right well known ports right well yes known ports right so this is server and this what we call it uh, ephemeral uh, port right yep so what is it client so the source is a client the destination is server so is this packet directed from client to server or vice versa it's a client to server because the source is a client and the destination is server you agree right so so much information you could get from the header so much information in the exam okay uh, i will give you a header like this ram numbers and i'll ask you the same questions if you understand how to read the header that will be a piece of cake you agree you have to understand how the header works and you have to know how to convert <laughs> from hexadecimal to binary, which is something you learn in digital design. You agree? Yeah. Um, professor, mm -hmm. can you explain why it's a client to server again? I could, yes. So now in here, what is the source port number? It was CP84 in hexadecimal. We convert it to how much? 52,100. Okay, converting from hexadecimal to to decimal, all right? And what is the destination port number? It's 0, 0, 0, D. When you convert it to decimal 13. So if you remember from last lecture, we said the first thousand ports, what we call them? Well-known ports, all right? So from 0 to 1,023, we call them well-known ports. And who usually have the well-known ports? Servers. The server. Okay. And uh, above that, we call them ephemeral ports. And who have them usually? The client. Client. So if the source is a client and the destination is source, then it's what? 
client to server client to server okay so as long as the uh destination port is below 1200 it's going to be a server below 1000 or below 1000 okay yes you call them well known ports well known ports okay thank you you're welcome so what is the client process okay what is the client process Okay, this is a win known port, right? 13. 13, what is 13? It's a day time process. Okay, so day time process. If you go and you search, for example, in here, okay, well known, well known ports list. anywhere if you go to 13 daytime protocol 13 is daytime protocol as you see in here all right all right a 21 FTP 22 SSH 23 telnet and so on and so forth these are the first 1000 protocols are when known you know we we'll call them the when known okay when up to 1023 and we'll call them one when known then after that we have registered ports up to 4000 registered ports up to 4000 and then after that we have the ephemeral uh, ports okay okay then after that after that we have the ephemeral, ephemeral ports all right dynamic private ephemeral ports all right so i hope that is uh, a clear that you know okay all right any questions so far all right and this is the solution we already okay so what are the udp services okay so it, it provides you three services. The first surface is a process to process communication. The second one is it's a connectionless surface. Let's take a look at the flow control, the error control, congestion control, encapsulation and decapsulation, queuing, multiplexing, demultiplexing, um, uh, uh, and then comparison between UDP and generic simple uh, uh, protocol. All right. So uh, these are the well-known ports used with UDP. Okay, when, okay, so you remember we were talking at 13. This is returns the date, date and time. And there is other, other protocols, many other protocols use UDP. Not as much as, uh, not as much as um, uh, definitely as um, um, uh, TCP, but there is uh, there is uh, uh, a few. Um, a uh, few um, uh, protocols or um, uh, you, uh, yeah if you use like the UDP right all right so these are the win known ports used in UDP so this process to process uh, communication all right then you know we know it's a connectionless uh, surface so we know it's a connectionless surface um, again what is connectionless surface um, the user datagram are not numbered. The user datagrams are not numbered. Also, there is no connection establishment. So there is no numbers for the. There is no sequence numbers. There is no establishment. There is no connection. You start the connection. That means that the user datagram can can travel on a different path. Okay. So the datagram could go in a different uh, paths so it's not a connection oriented protocol there is no sequence number um, uh, each datagram could have different path you don't establish one path to transfer uh, the data all right then after that flow control 
uh, the other surface flow control. So U2P is very simple protocol. Uh, there is no flow control. There is no flow control. All right. Then when you take a look at the error control, there is no error control mechanism in UDP as well. We don't have a, 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 an error control. All right. Then after that, it provides a checksum. Checksum is for the integrity. So if you take a look at the header, you will have the source port address, 16 bits or 2 bytes, and the destination port address, which is 16 bits or 2 bytes. All right, and then we have the data, right? The data, and and uh, and we have to add padding, all right, to make it multiple of 16 bits. We have to make it multiple of 16 bits. So if we are short four bits, we add four zeros. If we are short six bits, we we'll add four uh, six uh, zeros. So to make it part multiple of uh, 16s. All right. All right. So in here you have the uh, pseudo header. So in here 30, 32 bit source IP address. Then you have the pseudo header means it's not yet the real header. It's almost there. So 32 bit destination address IP address. Then you have here all zeros, 8 bit protocol and 16 bit UDB total length. The total length of the, the UDB. All right. All right, so um, the pseudo header uh, again is a part of the uh, part of the header of the IP packet in which the user datagram to be encapsulated with some field felt, fields filled with zero, as you see, uh, and and here. Okay, the protocol field is added to ensure. Okay, the protocol field is added to ensure that the packet belongs to the UDB and not to the TCP. All right. So let's take example shown the checksum calculation for a very small user datagram with only seven bytes. So the datagram only seven bytes plus eight for the header. Because the number of the bytes of the data is odd, padding is, is added. So remember that we have to have like even number and has to be divided by 16 or multiples of 16. Okay, so the CDU holder as well as the padding will be dropped when the user datagram arrived. So let's take a look in here. So let's take a look in here. Okay, 32 bit. Okay, this is the 32 bit IP address, source address. This is the 32 bit destination address. Here, put all zeros. And then what we have, we have the 8-bit protocol. So 17, which is the UDP protocol. And then what we will have, the 16-bit UDP total length. The total length. The total length is 15. And it's in the, yeah, 15. All right. So in here we have the source port. We have the destination port. We have the total length, you see 15, 15, the total length, and this set up to zeros. And we'll calculate the checksum, and add, the checksum will be calculated, all right, and added to here before sending. All right, so the checksum will be calculated and added to here uh, before sending. So where is the bad? So this is like T E S. Okay, and then here, that's the bad added um, in, in here. All right, so you take the first 16 bit, which is in here, in here, and you convert it to a binary. You take the next 16 bit, which is in here, convert to the binary, then the 171.2, 171.2, then the 14.10, this is a 14.10, and then you, you know, take the... Um, um, 0 and 17 okay 0 and 17 the one in here and here this is the zeros okay and this is the 17 in here then you have the 15 in here okay the 15 in here 
and the and the 16 bits in here the 13 the 15 and this is where we're going to calculate the checksum right and then you have in here um uh you know uh, the uh, let's go back in here the data padding okay the data so this is the data so uh testing the data is testing okay t e s t i and and because it's not uh, a, a complete you know uh, uh, 16 bits we're gonna add a padding uh, which is like um, basically the padding is all zeros right zeros as you see it in here all zeros all right now we add all of these the sum and then we complement them to get the checksum the checksum in here which is how many bits 16 bits will go where will go here okay the checksum and then the packet will be sent this way all right when it arrives to the destination we need to make sure there is no data change there all right so we calculate the checksum again all right and do the complement and should give you zero and the destination should give you zero all right so what value is sent for checksum in one of the following hypothetical situations the first situation the sender decides not to include the checksum okay the sender decides not to include the checksum so what is the value what's the value will be so the value sent for the checksum fields is all zeros okay to show that the checksum is not calculated so the checksum is optional it could be calculated it could be omitted it's good to calculate it to check if there is an error in that if you don't want to use checksum you put all zeros in here you don't do all of these calculations this all calculations you don't do you don't add it in here you send all zeros got it the second question the sender decides to include the checksum but the value of the sum is all ones oh my god that's all ones what where is the problem if the all if all ones so if we add all of these in here okay this will get all ones one 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 is there a problem with that Is there a problem? Should we? What's a problem? Um, corrupted or like uh, it's a. It's not corrupted. I mean, it's, it's real it's data, but you know, you you are you're lucky that when you add everything up in here, it becomes all ones. Is there a problem with that? going to be like uh, special case uh, yeah what's a special case yes it's a special broadcast case. because broadcast. what you, but because what you have to do if it's all, what is the next step to do the uh, to do the complement right yes which is going to be all zeros will be all zeros so you're going to put all zeros in here right so now the destination will get confused yeah where it should go so okay, confused because there is two situations the situation i don't want to send the checksum what i will do i put all zeros yeah and there's a situation i'll put the checksum but the checksum is all zeros so now the destination will think what uh, that we did not use the checksums we sent all zeros but that's not yeah. true we it just happened that all ones and the complement is all zeros right mm -hmm. so that's a problem so what we'll do when the sender complements the sum the result is all zeros the sender complements the result again before sending so it will it does not send all zeros it sends all ones the value sent for the checksum is all ones the second complement operation is needed to avoid confusion with the case in part a that we explained part a there's no checksum in here there is checksum but the checksum all zeros so now the destination will be confused to get confused 
all zeros could have zeros if there is no checksum or there is checksum but the complement is all ones so whenever we get a checksum all zeros we complement it back to ones got it yes, a special case to solve the problem then when you go to C, the sender decides to include the checksum, but the value of all the sums are zero. So now if we complement it, okay, it will be all ones. Right? And again, the destination will be confused. It might be all ones or it's this situation. So this situation never happens because it is implies that the value of every term included in the calculation is zeros. It's impossible to send source address all zeros, destination address all zeros, port all zeros. So this scenario will not happen. If it happens, it will be a problem. It will be another confusion. It will be another uh, confusion. Then we have the encapsulation and decapsulation. Before that, the congestion control. We said we don't have con flow control. Then we don't have congestion control. As simple as that then encapsulation and decapsulation so you have the sender process it will build the message like in our example in here what was the message testing right testing right whatever the application all right and the UDP data will go here we'll add the UDP header and this all of this we're gonna become the IP data and then we add the IP header all of this will become the frame data and will add the frame header that's encapsulation at the destination we do the reverse process right so as we go up we delete the header before we go up we delete this header and before we go up we delete this header and of course we gotta use it first right so in here, what I gonna get? I gonna get the destination port address. Then the destination port address, for example, 13, you'll send it to port 13, okay? It will be sent to the port 13. Then, you know, uh, queuing. I mean, when there is communication, it's not only one message, right? The application or the process will send 100, 200, 1,000, 5,000 messages. All right, so you are not able to send all of them at the same time, so you have to do queuing, right? You have to do queuing, all right? So the UDP in here, it will, uh, this is, will go to a uh, queuing, um, um, uh, outgoing queue, okay, port 13. Then it will come to the incoming queue, port 52,000, all right, in this way. And, and then it will go to to the server and back away in the other way it will be queued in the port of uh, five two thousand five thousand i'm sorry fifty two thousand and then it will be sold to the incoming queue so we'll have outgoing queue and we'll have incoming queue in both destination all right and that will help uh, to control the the process all right then the last thing is multiplexing uh, multiplexing and demultiplexing so usually when you have a UDP multiplexer multiple processes are running right okay so think about like your browser internet so you'll open the, the browser five times this is five processes of the same process right right so you could have FTP, all right, which you, uh, or TFTP, which use UDP. So you could have five sessions or five processes. So and all of them they need to go through UDP, all right. So you don't want to mix. So the data from this one has to go to this one, right? You don't want to mix them. So you will do multiplexer, okay, and and it will be sent to the UDP. The UDP will. Uh, send it to uh, to the IP. We'll send it to the IP, and once the the transport layer receives it, it'll do the demultiplexing. So what was sent from X, okay, will go to X. What was sent from one, gonna go 
to 1. What was sent from C gonna go to C? What was sent from Z gonna go to Z? So multiplexing and demultiplexing. So these are all the functions, okay, functions that we have uh, for the uh, UDP. So UDP is built in one, pro which protocol, transport protocol? Remember, we have four transport protocols, right? Simple, stop and wait, go back in, selective repeat, right? So which one UDP is using? Is a simple stop and wait, go back in, selective repeat. UDB they it doesn't have flow control or so how it's gonna use like one of those like the four? Uh simple simple S doesn't have flow control. Point simple. Simple. All right, so it's not UDP, it's yeah. not thank you, it's not not okay, all right. So it's a simple, it's using the simple uh, protocol, all right. So UDP is an example of the connectionless simple protocol we discussed in the chapter 13, with the exception of an optional checksum. That's the only difference, okay, it will have an optional checksum added to the packets for error detection that's the only difference all right so let's take a look at UDP applications so why we need UDP okay UDP almost none or you know you know it does not provide control uh, error control error control does not provide um, congestion control does not provide um, uh, flaw control why we need to use it what's the reason that that some of the services use UDP why you, they use the UDP all right that, streaming all right so uh, as you know uh, it, it's used in um, um, again what are the features is connectionless okay it's a connectionless so example in here the client server applications such as dns okay domain name server uses services of udb because the client needs to send a short request remember one of the advantage of udb is a very short short request to a server and re receive a quick response so it's short the whole message it will fit in where in one packet so it's not like a huge message that you're gonna divide it in packets and each packet will have like a sequence number it's one message a small short message you could fit in one packet all right and we need to send it very quick uh, we don't want to spend time for error control flow control and all of that and get the response very quick all right so UDP is a perfect fit for DNS packets. It's a short packet that could fit in one packet, send it and get the response uh, easily. All right. Uh, okay. And we don't care about the connectionless feature. The client or server does not worry that the message are delivered out of order because there is only one packet. So that's a good example for you to be to use. Another example. A client server application such as simple management, um, um, simple um, um, uh, mail transport protocol, which is used to, in electric mail, cannot use the services of UDB because a user can send a long email, a long email message, which may include multimedia which must include multimedia. What is multimedia? Like video or images. If the application uses UDP and the message does not fit in a single user datagram, the message must be split by the application into different user datagrams. So it will be like 10, 5, 200 datagrams. All right. So we're going to use connectionless. So the user datagram will arrive out of order. So will, packets will be before packets. So 
if you send a message, all right, and the message says, I love a bridge board. And because it does not fit in one packet, you're going to go in multiple datagrams, and they arrive out of order. All right? So that will be a problem. All right? UDP does not fit here. So the receiver application may not be able to reorder the pieces. This means the connectional surface has a disadvantage for an application program that sends long messages. So in here, UDP was very useful because it's one block, one message, all right? In here, it does not fit. So that's why mail protocols, they don't use UDP. What they use? TCP. Use uh, TCP. Another example, assume we are downloading a very large text file, very large text file from the Internet. We definitely need to use transport layer that provides reliable surface. We don't want part of the file to be missing or corrupted. But we know UDP is connectionless. It's not reliable. All right? Right? So the delay created between the delivery of the parts are not an overriding concern for us. We wait until the whole file is uh, composed before looking at it. In this case, UDB is, again, is not a suitable transport. And that's why we use TCP. All right. Take one more example. Okay, assume that we are watching a real-time stream. All right? Before we continue, real-time stream, what should we use? UDP or TCP? UDP. UDP. Because, like, think about, think about, you, you know, TCP will correct the errors. So, you are, listen, I'm talking to you, hello, how are you? Oh, oh uh, you know, I'm trying to fix my, my, my uh, things I say or something wrong in my tone or something in my, uh, I said or in the voice or recorded. It will make it worse. So, right? So the best thing when you are transferring audio, for example, let it just come as it is. Even if there is slight errors, don't fix them. Because when you try to fix them, what will do? You'll make it worse. Right? And you'll make it worse. Right? Or, for example, you're sending an image. So there is an error. So if it appears a green, then black, and then... So there are some situations you should not fix what you are transmitting. All right, you should not fix what you are transmitting. Just take it as it is. This is one example. So in the real-time stream, real-time stream video on your computer, such a program is considered a long file. So long file, we know it needs TCP. That's fine. It is divided into many small parts and broadcast in real time. The parts of the message are sent one after another. If the transport layer is supposed to resend an, a corrupted or lost frame, the synchronizing of the whole transmission may be lost. So there's no synchronization. All right. So the viewer suddenly sees a blank screen because you're correcting now. Like, right? You're sending. So then it becomes black screen and then needs to wait until the second, you know, you know, the correct packet comes and all of that, that will cause a flickering, will cause a problem. That's why when we're trying to send an audio or images, we use uh, UDP, okay? Uh, because, like, you know, using TCP will make it worse, will make it worse, all right? So, um, the, the UDP package to show you how UDP handles the sending and receiving of UDP packets. Okay, there is, you know, this is a block that, you know, show you the UDP, the UDP design. So there's a process. If you remember that we have a queues, all right, the queue and the data. This is the end model, the UDP user datagram. And there is a control block, okay, control block, that, uh, 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 so, um, so what is a control block um, table? And UDP, UDP has a block table to keep track of open ports. So sometimes multiple open ports are open, right? 
So each entry in this has a minimum of four fields. Four fields, as you see it in here. Uh, four fields. All right. Um, it tell you the state. It tell you the state. It's a free. This port is a free, or in use, or what is a process? Uh, 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 you know, in use process ID, and uh, the port number. Okay, and the queue number. It attached to it. So if I have 13, is it a free? Is it in use? Which queue is attached to? Okay, it's like a database for the program in here. Okay, so that's the control block table. All right. And this is the engine for it. And the same thing with the output uh, module. Okay, this is that's the code, how it works. All right, so this is the, what we were talking about, the control block table. So the state, it's in use. The process ID, what is the process ID? What is the port number? And what is the queue number? All right. All right, this is a free, it could be used. This is in use, all right, and so on and so forth. So what is it is used and all of that. So, okay, and in here, and of course, it will evolve. I mean, this table, it will evolve as ports are being used and released. So the first activity in the arrival of the user datagram with the destination port number is, this is the port number, 52012, all right? The input module searches for this port number and finds it. So it's in the table. Okay, so 15 is here. It's in here in the table, finds it, 52. The input module searches for this port number and finds it. Q number 38 has been assigned to this port. A Q, see the Q, 38, assigned for that. And again, okay, remember this is the Q, this is the table and it will connect the port to the queue all right so this is the port number this is the queue all right okay which means that the port has been previously used the input module sends the data to q38 and the control block table does not change so this will be the block table the block control table in here which we are viewing in here does not change another scenario in here after a few seconds a process starts a process process starts it asks for operating system to port number and is granted the port number 5214 so the operating system gives it the 52 the 52014 52014 which is in here all right now the process sends its id so there is a process id it will be added to the table so this is the process ID, right? I'm sorry. Okay, the 4978. And the port number to the control block module to create an entry in the table. The module takes the first free entry, because this is like a new uh, port request, free entry, and inserts the information received. The module does not allocate a queue at this moment because no user datagram have arrived. All right? So it's an empty it was empty let's go back in here if you remember this was free empty now there is a new request okay it will pick the, the operating system will give the port number it will check the process now when the data start to come it has to pick a queue a queue okay these are the queues in here a queue so there's multiple queues right so maybe this a queue and this is 40 for example or 39 then after it picks a queue Okay, a 40 will be added to this in here. That's a queue number will be added in here. Got it? All right. So another example in here, a user datagram now arrives for port 5211. 5211, that's the port, arrives for 4211. Attached to Q43, and this is the process ID, and this is in use. Okay. 
The input module checks the table and finds there is no queue has been allocated for this destination. So this is the first time our user datagram has arrived of this destination. So what does it do? Go and it allocates a queue and add it. And that's what we did. Added the queue for it. Another example. After a few seconds, a user datagram arrives for port 52222. All right. The input module checks the table and cannot find the entry for this. So there is a data coming for this port, but the door port does not exist. So the user datagram is dropped. There is no port. I mean, you send it to this port, but there is no port established. So the datagram will be uh, dropped. Okay. So a very elegant, very nice system as you see how it works. All right. And we just explained the most easy protocol UDP. If we go to the TCP, remember the TCP, what does it have to do? Do you know what TCP has to do? Take and shake. Huh? Is it a three hand shake? It has to do uh, establish the connection. Handshake. It has to do error control. It has to do flow control. It has to do congestion. Okay, and congestion control. It has to do to do so many other things so they come the protocol will be much more complex than we have seen in the UDP you agree so it will be much much more complex all right um, unfortunately we we don't have time to cover more I wanted to go over the TCP or one of the applications so and, and okay to, to review right now as you see in this class we started covering the OSI reference model right all right, so we started with the OSI reference model. Um, so we spoke about the physical layer, then we spoke about the data link layer, then we moved up to the network layer. In the network layer, we spoke about ARP, SEMP, about the IP itself, right? Then we came to the transport protocol and we took example, uh, one example, let's just go back in here. And we, I, I mean, again, I mean, in here we spoke about the Ethernet technology uh, um, very well. We spoke about the data link layer. Then we came to the IP or the network layer. We explained IP, IP4, how it works exactly, ARP, how it works exactly, SEMB, how it works exactly, exactly. And we spoke about routing protocols. We took RIP as an example, all right, which you'll see it in your exam. Then in the transport layer, there is multiple different protocols. We started with the easy one, UDP. But if we have like extension for this course, we'll go over TCP and the SC, SCTP protocol for streaming. All right. And so and then after that in here, there is like tens or hundreds of application layers. So FTP, how it works, SMTP, how it works, mail, how it works, and so on and so forth. So now you will have a very comprehensive understanding and I'm sure you understand very well that you know how data moves. When you do the labs and you do the Wireshark and uh, in the lab, okay, you have like 10 days to do it before you submit everything, you will see that how the data, you know, you're dealing with bits actually, all right? And we have seen some of the examples in here by reading the header, you will be able to check many things, all right? Okay, wire chart is useful to read only in one condition if the data is not encrypted. If it's encrypted, you'll not be able to read the data because the data is like garbled, right? So if you like to if you like to play with the wire chart, just look for uh, HTTP uh, pages, not HTTPS, uh, to download the data, download the data and play with it because if you download the HTTPS, the data will be, you know, encrypted, garbled, you'll not be able to figure things out. And that's the idea of encryption. That's the whole idea of, in, of, of encryption. All right. So to go back and refresh our memory, I mean, like, uh, like in the OSI reference model, how many layers we have? Let me see people I never asked. I mean, there's people I always asked. So uh, let me, Shabam, Shabam, uh, where is Shabam? 
Put your videos. Let me see you. This is the last class. Let me see where is everybody. Shabam, are you there? Uh, yes, Professor. How are you? Uh, good, Professor. Good. Did you hear the question? Uh, sir, uh, can you repeat the question? I could, yes. Okay. Okay. The question is for the OSI reference model. All right. Yeah. How many layers we have? Uh, seven. Seven. What are they? Uh, physical layer, data link, trans, uh, network, transport, uh, session, presentation, and application. An application layer. Excellent. All right. Thank you. Let me ask another person. Just review now, just for fun. Okay. Uh, uh, Sagan. Uh, Karki. Yes, Professor. So, um, now, um, for the IP6, all right, IP6, all right, do you know how is it different from IP4? I'm not sure, I mean, if you are hearing me or... Yeah, I'm hearing you. Um... IP4 is 32-bit uh, binary number. Uh, IP6 is a 128-bit binary number. Right, right, right. So, right, but that's a simple answer. I'm sure there is much, much more in IP6. You know, that's okay. All right, so what I'm trying to tell you, I started teaching DCC, um, I think, first time in 1998. I was baby at that time. So I used to go to the class with pepperoni. Okay. Uh, and at that time when I was teaching the kids, I was telling them about the IP6 in a couple of years, IP4 is gone, IP6 will be there everywhere. And it's about 20 years or more than 20 years until now we use IP4, right? So I don't, I don't say that anymore, but I could tell you this. With the advent with the IoT, where you'll have billions and billions of nodes hooked or connected to the internet, and you need more IP addresses, there's no room for IP4. IP6 must come, right? Um, IP6, uh, there is very designed parts of it, all right? So, uh, um, uh, you know, um, uh, for example, you don't have the classes that we have an IP, uh, we don't need that because we, we have like 128 bits, uh, which is like each one of us will get like maybe like 100,000 IP addresses. Each one in the world will be able to get like 100,000 IP addresses. So there's so many IP addresses that you don't worry about them finishing. All right. Um, one of the problems of the TCP IP or, or IP4, I'm sorry, one of the problems, it did not have built-in extension, built-in um, for mobile. So we had to have an extension. IP4, it might handle that in much nicer uh, way. It will handle congestion in much more nicer way. Also, an uh, in IP, IP by itself, it does not handle streaming and uh, different issues. IP4, I meant. IP6 does. So IP6 will be a big plus, a big advantage once it's used. Uh, hopefully in a few years, that's what we will see it everywhere. Uh, again, because the need, because of the need uh, for, uh, uh, for, you know, um, uh, more IPs and all of that. Okay. Um, I was reading an article yesterday okay and uh, now there is a new technology coming in the research labs maybe we'll see it now that will allow transfer of data to be super super speed to the point to the point that you'll be able to download all the content of netflix in one second Imagine that all the content of Netflix in one second. So, if you remember, uh, I'm not sure. Uh, I mean, who is the most old person there? That's a wrong question to ask. 
I think me in this class okay so I remember when I started using like modems when I started using the internet there was no you know ethernet cards at home so there was something called mod modems anybody use modems before you have to dial through the phone number did anybody use it before you did all right you look much younger than this but that's fine all right so modems we use the modems okay when we use the modems as the first modem i used myself was 14.4 14.4 watt anybody knows what's the unit kilobits per Maybe. second kilobits per second sir kilobits per second and wow I mean 14.4 and you browse the internet and you are able to grab all of that that was something the moment in the market they had the 28.8 uh, uh, kilobits per second right away I bought it and I remember it was like 80 bucks yeah that's in 1997 or 8 whatever then 36.6 .6, then 64.4 I remember you know because I grew up with this right I grew up with this all right so at that time we were using kilobits per second kilobits per second right all right so and then after that the cable and the dsl you know coming and it starts to have like 600 kilobits per second then one mega two mega and all of this so if now i mean if you do in here enter uh, uh speed speed internet a test enter speed internet test whatever okay let's do a test in my in my computer right now it will be slow because i'm connected to the vpn so let me disconnect the vpn let me try it again okay So now Wait, I Professor. Yes, sir. Why is it slow with the VPN? <laughs> there is for many reasons. Uh, VPN, when you connect to the VPN to an institution, you know, they control your flow, the quality of surface, because many people connecting. Anyways, there's many reasons. It's, it's, it is always controlled. All right. So in here, uh, it's about four. 411 411 watt what's the unit megabyte megabyte okay megabytes who said what bytes megabit megabit i mean whoever told megabytes send me his name he's failing the class i mean somebody okay just show me your head Usually we measure we measure speed with megabits per second. We we measure like the storage with bytes, right? Megabits per second. So it's like like you know, I mean only twenty years, twenty years. So okay, it's like uh, it's like uh, how much? It's like uh, ten thousand times or thousand yeah ten thousand times faster. So mega, the mega between kilo and mega is like thousand, right? Thousand faster. And between uh, 14.4 and 400, there's another zero about 10,000 times faster in 20 years. All right? Um, uh, that's why we are able to see Netflix high definition videos and all of that. So all of this happening because of what? Because of one technology, you think? Because of one scholar like, you know, Mr. Laziz doing something nice or uh, uh, our zoo or it's like a collective work of thousands or millions of people working, everybody work in part of the whole puzzle. People looking in, in physics, the people dealing with the fiber and in, uh, you know fiber and uh, encapsulation and uh, signal processing and all of that that's that's hardware okay other people working in the the encoding techniques you know remember when we started encoding how encoding happened 
other group working in compression techniques how you compress the data and they do the data and all of that right a compression um, uh, for security now there's no data sent not secure everything is secure as you can hear if it's not secure done you're gone right okay encryption and all of that so it's like millions or tens of millions of papers and articles and research work and companies trillions maybe of dollars invested in the whole including in infrastructure research and all of that so where are you in this game what's your part of this game right all right that's why in this class I told you you are not a technician if it's like a, a, a a school that you know uh, teach like a vocational school you know what we'll do we'll get your servers connect the wires plug them and install windows see how they connect and all of that right that's a very very easy to teach very easy to to do by yourself to be a scholar to understand the concepts how things are built how things are work okay that you are eligible to move from here to another course and from the another course, maybe after a while you, uh, you earn your master's, and from master's you got your PhD. And in the PhD you spend seven years doing research in one topic. And you know what's the outcome of that research? It's one paper or two papers, two journal papers. You publish it and share the knowledge you gained. People after you will come, they will take your knowledge and the other knowledge from different place. They learn from it and they work. They produce, they publish it, they share it with the whole community, and the life continues. And that's how everything grows. All right? That's it. Okay? That's how we are growing. That's how is technology growing. It's not anymore one country that manipulates and controls everything. It's not the United States only. It's not Russia only. It's not India only. It's not Libya only. It's not Turkey only. It's not Greece only, okay, it's the whole human, whole research community working together on all of that, okay? So you really need to appreciate how technology is changing day by day and how it's improving. If just run a punch, not a punch, it's a benchmark, any benchmark with what we used to have only 20 years ago and what we have right now, you'll see like the improvement and the magnitude of improvement in hundreds or in thousands all right and that's why i need you to appreciate what you learn when you do your master's degree when you go to a class and you learn these concepts how algorithms are built how the communication is happening you might ask yourself where am i gonna use this all right I mean, I'm going to go, maybe I will open a store, try to be like a technician or something. If that's your plan, maybe it's a waste of time to do masters. So usually we study, we go for the sake of knowledge. And I, I bet you, if you followed with me in this class, now you really have deep understanding how communication happened. Remember in the first class, I told you communication in computers within computers it's exactly like a human communication it's kind of we learned how a human communicate the algorithm the, the the protocol and we built a protocol for it all right and that's come the importance of standard so when you have a standard out there everybody wants to contribute they have to look up to the standard and follow the standard and build up on the standard you don't want to like everybody have his or her own standard right so that's the whole idea how much did we cover uh, from this theory maybe like a quarter or 20 percent there is a lot to learn okay so there is summer work for you that you you know see you know if you go through it okay now you pick any chapter any topic you have the foundation you have the foundation so you'll be able to read through it you'll be able to understand and you'll appreciate it 
where you go from here as i told you this course this is your data computer communication is foundation course for many many areas many many other courses if you need to do network security you have to know network first you have to know dcc right if you need to know to do um, 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 internet of things you need to know this if you need to do cloud computing you know you need to know the foundation in here and so on and so forth right programming even if you need to do http client server applications you have to have some foundation uh, to understand this you agree yeah all right any i mean feel free to disagree i mean um, seriously i mean i love people who disagree with me more the people more than people agrees with me so if you so the room is yours any questions any comments any ideas that you would like to share with me as I told you from the very beginning, you know, um, especially in the master's level program, we learn from each other. I learn from you as much as you learn from me. And the only difference, I mean, we are equal in the class. Seriously, that's what I believe. We are equal in the class. The only difference we have that I get to grade you. Okay, that's it. All right, that's it. Um, and you... And, and mostly, uh, all of you almost did very well in this class. Thank you so much for your hard work. So, any questions? Uh, the floor is yours. Uh, Prof, sir, do you want to do the lecture? If possible. What? Uh, can I talk to you after the lecture, if possible? Uh, yeah, you could, yeah. Sure, thank you. Prof, sir.